So it's what is EOS, an introduction to delegated proof of stake. So before I get into it, I should say that I am in no way um, affiliated with the EOS.io software or the Block One team. I am only a student of liberty, of blockchains, and I find this stuff captivating. I'm an uh, anarcho-capitalist, a student of Austrian economics. I hold a pair of bachelor degrees in computer electrical engineering, former head of business development for Euro Pacific Bank in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I have a podcast, Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast, where I've interviewed over the past over two years um, a lot of the heads, the CEOs, the founders of a lot of cryptocurrency companies, including Eric Voorhees, Patrick Byrne, Andreas Antonopoulos, Roger Veer, Charlie Schramm, tons more. You can check it out at the website libertyentrepreneurs.com. I'm also the founder and CEO of Liberty Virtual Assistants, where I help digital entrepreneurs hire affordable yet experienced staff or virtual assistants in the Philippines. All right. I should mention that I learned about, first learned about Bitcoin in 2011. I was so into gold and silver and precious metals in 2011 that I quit my engineering job to move to the Caribbean to help build a gold and silver backed bank. And so even though I'd learned about Bitcoin in 2011, I didn't take it seriously and start researching it in 2012 and didn't start buying Bitcoin until 2013. So that's a little bit of my background. But enough about me. I have some questions to ask you. What if there was a blockchain that could handle over 100,000 transactions per second. One that had zero fee transactions and less than three second block times. Where we had stakeholder approved or coin holder approved project funding and a voluntary weighted governance system. Reliably confirmed transactions every 10 seconds instead of like six, six confirmations or four confirmations or however many every 10 seconds you would have a reliable confirmation. Secure a blockchain network without having to spend millions of dollars a day on electricity. You could ICO your own currency. You could hedge your portfolio by buying fiat pegged cryptocurrencies. You could create loans and loan yourself interest free money using your own cryptocurrencies as collateral. Basically actually be in your own bank have a decentralized I mean have a wallet with a decentralized exchange built into it so you can basically trade within your wallet without having to trust third-party exchanges holding your private keys and generate cash flow flow from staked coins in a lend lease market right you could have a human readable account name instead of 1X537ZC, right? It could say Ash Oro. We do have this. It's called Delegated Proof of Stake. It's been in existence since 2014, and it's probably the most underrated blockchain in existence right now, and that's the fundamental argument that I'm going to try to make today. So before I dive into EOS, since EOS is still in its year-long ICO and it won't have a working product until June the 1st of next year, the best way to get an idea of what EOS is is to look at the type of blockchain that it uses, delegated proof of stake, and look at other delegated proof of stake blockchains that were created years ago. So the two examples I'm going to use are BitShares, which was created by Dan Larimer back in 2014, as well as Steam, which was created by Dan Larimer and Ned Scott back in 2016. All right. So if you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand. I'll try to answer the questions mid-roll here. Uh, but if you think it's going to be a complicated question or one that's going to draw a lot of conversations, if you don't mind, try to save it at the end just so I can keep momentum and keep rolling here. All right. All right. Before we get started, let's go over what proof of work, proof of stake, and delegated proof of stake is. These are very simple definitions and by no means are fully encompassing. Proof of work was the first type of blockchain. It is Bitcoin, Litecoin, currently Ethereum, Dash, Dogecoin. It was the first iteration of how to keep a blockchain secure. Basically, the blockchain protocol rewards whoever can come up with the cheapest electricity in order to produce the largest hash rate to secure the network. 
So back in the day, we used to be able to mine Bitcoin with our laptops. And then as the Bitcoin network grew, so did the difficulty of the, the hashing algorithm, the algorithm to find the new blocks, to get the block reward, and the larger, more powerful computers you would need. We've seen um, now people are moving to Iceland, or the reason that they move, miners move to China is because they get a very deep discount on their electricity, and that's why we've seen a centralization in some of these areas. Uh, proof of work is protected by its hash rate, so a hacker would need to have, everyone's familiar with the 51% attack. In proof of work, you basically need to have 51% of the hash rate in order to leverage a, a real like size attack on the network. So what is delegated proof of stake? Delegated proof of stake is a blockchain protocol where the holders or hodlers, stakers of the coin should have the role and responsibility of securing the network. This is how blocks are produced in a proof of stake system. You stake your coins and for the percentage, proportion amount of coins that you have staked, you would be the witness of a block. And basically the attack vector here is if you have 51% of the coins of a network, you stake those coins, you have a 51% chance of mining the next block. Delegated proof of stake is a bit different. Uh, the coin holders are considered shareholders who vote on the block producers. So it introduces a bit of a human element into the blockchain. You basically, it's a community oriented blockchain where people have to prove who they are, build respect in the community, and they get voted upon in a voluntary democracy system. These block validators get paid out of the block reward to uh, witness the blocks and produce the blocks rather than just anyone that can uh, buy and stake coins. And I know, so this is confusing, we'll get into it later, but proof of work, proof of stake, delegated proof of stake. Okay, so what is a DAC? Has, raise your hand if you've heard of the term a DAC or a decentralized autonomous corporation or company. Okay, so not very many. Um, Bitcoin was the first DAC. Basically, think of a DAC as a company, okay? And just think of a company itself outside of decentralized or autonomous, because those are less significant at the moment. A company has revenues, costs, employees, shareholders, voting, charter, products, and customers. All right, this is how the current world works. This is how companies exist. You can see the example here, Bitcoin was the first DAC. Its product was a payment service. It competes against Swift and PayPal and Visa. Its revenue is transaction fees. Shareholders are the holders of the coin. Its employees are the miners. Its costs are the transaction fees. And actually, I messed that up. Revenue is block reward. Its customers are anyone that uses the platform to send and receive. Voting, it has a voting method, right? It's the miners. And its charter is the operating source code, the open source code. So just keep in the back of your mind that cryptocurrencies are companies, right? Even the first one, it's a company. Autonomous means that it runs on its own. Decentralized means that it's decentralized around the world. So just, just keep that in the back of your mind during this entire presentation is that cryptocurrency networks do run just like companies do. All right, so let's, let's talk about BitShares. BitShares was created by Dan Larimer and launched in July 2014 as a prototype now for EOS, all right? It was open source, public, blockchain-based, real-time financial platform. So it's basically a bank within your wallet. You can, you, there's no third party, there's no central authority to handle any of the funds, unlike, say, Bittrex, Poloniex, Bitfinex. You don't trust anyone else with your private keys. And it self-funds. So as a company, companies need funding, right? It self-funds through how the blockchain inflation and through the uh, commission cost on the exchange. Rather than in Bitcoin, where all the block reward is allocated to the miners, in BitShares, this is just an example for now, in BitShares, they have more intelligent inflation that gets paid out to incentivize different things on their blockchain rather than just mining. 
this is, in my opinion, one of the fatal flaws of Bitcoin, is that its incentive structure only incentivizes mining. So BitShares was the first delegated, delegated proof of stake system. This is a screenshot of BitShares, right? This is your wallet. This is your exchange. These right here, these are all tokens that you can trade. Steam, the US dollar, well this is Tether, right? You can create your own smart assets like BitSilver, which tracks the price of silver. So if you wanted to trade your Bitcoin or your BitShares or your Dash or whatever, your Ethereum for silver, then you could do it. Now it's not physical silver. You can't like call this on delivery and get physical silver bars into your house. But nonetheless, you can create your own smart assets in BitShares, just like you can create your own token in Ethereum. So you can see here, there's gain credits, there's lists, there's made safe, there's Steam dollars, there's everything. So just really quick, uh, BitShare smart coins or bit assets are something that I think is completely unknown at the moment and it's going to revolutionize banking. BitShares offers the ability to create smart coins, basically like an ERC-20 token on Ethereum, but it has to be backed, but it has to be collateralized. And that's really important because if you're, if you're creating a token that's not collateralized, then it really weighs on the value of that token, right? The, the token's value is derived from the promise that they, whoever sold you the token says that you can use it for. For all these ICOs, they're selling all these tokens and they get you know, evaluated up in the hundreds of millions of dollars, but what actually backs those tokens? There's, there's no value, right? It's a value of promise. If you're going to release a token on the BitShares network, it has to be backed with 200% of the value that you describe to it backed by the BitShares token itself. So for an example, if BitShares was at a dollar and you wanted to release your own token, Ashcoin, and I say that Ashcoin is worth a dollar and I wanted it to trade on the exchange, well, I would have to back every Ashcoin with two BitShares because that, give, that, that makes sure that volatile swings in the price of Ashshares or in BitShares, you, know, you have a 200% buffer there in case you need to get margin called. So these are fungible, divisible, free from any restrictions. You can send them to exchanges. And uh, I won't get any, into any more detail here, except that you can collateralize your own loans. So to give you a quick example, I have bit shares. I can, out of debt, I can collateralize my bit shares and I can create into existence US, bit US dollars that trades on the platform lock up my bit shares in, in uh, the DEX, the decentralized exchange, then buy, basically use that loan that I loaned to myself to buy more assets, to buy more bit shares. I'm leveraged up, right? I could be margin called, but I can offer myself 0% loans using the bit shares platform, right? This is why I think that not Bitcoin, but bit shares is going to replace the banks because you can't do that with any other coin at the moment. Literally, I'll say it again, collateralizing your own loan. That's basically like you saying, hey, I own this house. I want to get $50,000 in a loan, collateralizing your own house and creating dollars that you can go spend on the marketplace. That's exactly what you can do in BitShares. All right. Any questions about BitShares real quick before I move on to Steam? Dun, 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 dun. Yes, go ahead. <coughs> what is the mechanism if you default on the loan? So let's say you create a loan and the so distributed loan so many parties can buy it, obviously, right? Uh, no, nobody buys your loan. You can loan out to other people or you can make a loan collateralized loan for yourself. Maybe, maybe I didn't understand. Right. So the purpose of putting a collateral loan on, on your house is to get currency or cash or coins yep. in order to execute some other business, right? sure. in order to use it. Yep. So let's say you created a coin, you put, put a collateral on your house, and you put it on an exchange. You put the coins on exchange. Now, people can buy the coins, different people can. So it basically allows people to give you a portion of the loan. You don't need to go to the bank. Right. You can buy some coins. Somebody can buy, say, $100. Somebody can buy $1,000. And you end up getting fifty thousand dollars, right? Yep. Now you go and use it in a business, but in the event of default, 
what protocol or what mechanism does it fall at? Right, right. In, in the event of default or in the event that your collateral drops in value so much that it doesn't cover the loan. And this is all built in the, into the protocol itself. That's why you have to put up 200% of the loan value. You lock it up in a smart contract in the BitShares platform. If it drops to 150% 150, 150 if your collateral drops in value to 150% of the loan value, the, the protocol will margin call you. You pay back the lender with a, with a penalty. Yeah, good, good, really good question. Um, all right, let's talk about Steam. Has anybody heard of Steam? Has anybody not heard of Steam? All right, we got one back there. Congre Thank you for raising your hand. I'm sure there's other people too. So Steam was the second delegated proof of stake system, right? And it's a blogging and social media site on top of the Steam blockchain. So the Steam, Steam is the blockchain, steamit.com is the block explorer. Just like you would go to blockchain.info to take a look at the Bitcoin block explorer or countless other block explorers, the steamit.com looks like a social media platform, kind of like Reddit, but it's just a block explorer where you can see the transactions of the Steam blockchain. It just so happens that the transactions of the Steam blockchain are upvotes, comments, blog posts, and stuff like that. Um, Steam is typically in the number one or number two spot for transactions per day at around 70,000 transactions per day at the moment. I've got a really interesting chart here in a minute. Um, all the transactions are on chain. I know there's a whole lot of talk right now about on chain versus off chain and how's Bitcoin going to scale. Steam's already done it. They've already been able to do twice or three times the number of Bitcoin transactions on chain every single day at the moment. Um, let's see here. Oh, again, inflation, whereas Bitcoin has inflation that only pays the miners out. Steam uses its inflation or its share dilution, if we want to use the example of a company, to pay out engagement in the community, engagement that they want to incentivize. So uh, posting, commenting, right, upvoting, resharing, re re-steaming, or basically retweeting, anything that they want to incentivize they can incentivize by offering a block part of the new inflation or the blockchain payout to try to incentivize people to act in a certain way right and that's really important because if you've only been familiar with bitcoin up to this point you don't really think about how the inflation can work to incentivize actors to act in a certain way because all you've ever known is that bitcoin only pays the miners all right, I'll say that again. In the Bitcoin network, the inflation only pays the miners, whereas in some of these other blockchains, the inflation or the new block reward can go to incentivize actions that are outside of mining only. So think about that, right? If you had a blockchain and you wanted to create a community, a blockchain is just the backbone of a community. It's the way that we establish and record trust. Imagine if you could use your new block inflation to incentivize people to act in a certain way. Right? That's very, very powerful. In, in Bitcoin, it's only used to encourage or incentivize mining. This is Steemit. Uh, you can see that people get paid out. This is, this is real money, people. Um, it's, it's still in its beta phase. I think that's kind of um, a shame because they've been around for a year and a half. But people get paid out liquid cryptocurrencies that you can send to an exchange and you can trade it for Bitcoin, trade it for Ethereum, spend it, right? There's, there's online stores, not very many, that take the Steam currency, like companies take Bitcoin, for purchases, right? You could send, this, you could send, it, to, uh, send it to an exchange, buy Bitcoin, exchange it back into your bank account for cash. Put it on a debit card. People are literally getting paid $400 for a blog post, right? $300. I cashed out one today for $600. $600 for a blog post. Think of that incentivization, right? All right. Um, so not almost nobody's heard of BitShares. A lot of people have heard of Steam, but have no clue what it is. Let's take a look at the top 10 most used blockchains, because I think as an Austrian economist, there is something to be said about utility, right? Utility meaning is a blockchain used or not? You can see I took this, I started creating this slideshow, I think on Saturday, 
BitShares had over a million transactions in the previous 24 hours. And you can see what its average was. That, that was actually its record. I just happened to catch it on a record day. This is a, this is a little speedometer, or I guess if, you know, it's like your, your rev meter, your RPMs. This is how stressed the blockchain is with its current amount of transactional throughput. Oh, Neman. I hovered over this to show you guys that even with a million transactions in the past 24 hours, the, the BitShares blockchain was only using 0.36% of its available bandwidth. Let that sink in for a second. Old Grandpa Bitcoin sitting down here at about 400,000 transactions in the previous 24 hours. And I wish that I could have uh, hovered over it as well, but it's well over 100% capacity. With it, At the time, it had over 200,000 unconfirmed transactions sitting in the mempool. People waiting to get into a block so they can use the Bitcoin blockchain. Yes. I have another question. What kind of uh, activities is there is uh, contest on? Yeah, so the, the question was what type of activities on the Steemit blockchain uh, are on-chain transactions? Yeah, right, um, so everything is on-chain. In delegated proof of stake, every single transaction is on-chain. There is no such thing as off-chain transactions. For example, is it, uh, for example, uh, like uh, if I read a post, I open a post, does that count? Uh, no, no, if you open a post, that's a read-only. Ex execution, read-only executions, no. E everything is like submitting to the blockchain. So submitting a post or, su or upvoting or leaving a comment or retweeting or they call it re-steaming. So whenever you're engaging with the blockchain rather than just the read-only. Yep. Th think about it on Facebook. Every, every like, every share, every post, every, you know, every comment would be an on-chain transaction in Steam. That's, that's why Steam has so many transactions per day, is because there's a lot of community activity there. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So think of like if you explore Bitcoin blockchains, if you read the blockchain status, you're not know, transacting, you're just reading status of any transaction on any account, any, any address, so it's not true. Putting in anything into Bitcoin on the blockchain, so the same here. So reading doesn't count. Right, J just remember, the steamit.com website is only one block explorer for the Steam blockchain itself. Just like if you were to go view the Ethereum blockchain or the Bitcoin blockchain, you're not submitting any transactions, you're just looking at the transactions. The same as whenever you go to the steamit.com website and look at a post, you're not engaging with the blockchain, you're just doing a view only like a block explorer. Yeah. Um, what, what, is, what uh, about the BitShares? What makes the majority of transactions? Um, typically right now in BitShares is trading volume. Yeah, since a lot of people, back when Dan Larimer created BitShares, he created around the same time that Ethereum was created and he built a system that he thought was going to be, be used to ICO. Right? He thought that people were going to, but since you can create your own tokens on BitShares and there's zero transaction fees in delegated proof of stake systems, he thought that people would use BitShares to ICO and start building their applications on. For whatever reason, people used Ethereum to build their applications on. Um, so for now, it's only, it's only a transactional um, like exchange type of trading. Yeah. There was another question, I think? No. Anyways, all right, so these two are barely even stressed at all. Galos is uh, a fork of Steam where there's a Russian team that decided they wanted to have control over the, uh, their own s basic Steam inflation. Galos is a, a version of Steam but specifically designed for, uh, for the, a Russian audience. And you can see it's, it's not stressed at all either. A lot of these others aren't stressed. That's because nobody uses them. All right, let's keep going here. Uh, so this gives you a, a pie chart visual representation of the most active blockchains. This is every blockchain known, right? This is 
on this day, it was on this day, 50% of every transaction on every blockchain known, on-chain transaction, was done with either Steam or BitShares. Ethereum had 25%, that's because of crypto kitties. And then Bitcoin, 13.6%, and every other blockchain known was at 10.5%. Don't worry, we'll get into crypto kitties here in a second. All right, let's talk a little bit about scaling. Um, these are some of the average or upper limit transactions per second from various systems around the world. Bitcoin weighs in at a, a heavy and powerful seven, and that is its upper limit. Uh, Ethereum has about 25 possible transactions per second. This is upper limit, people, 25 transactions per second. Visa does about 2,000, the NASDAQ does 10,000, Google does 34,000, and BitShares slash Steam slash WillBeEOS has right now an upper limit of about 100,000 plus transactions per second. If you want to get more info on some of this, I pulled all this data from blocktivity.info right there. So you can check that out, blocktivity.info. All right, let's talk about Bitcoin for a second. So in a delegated proof of stake system, transactions are free to send. You don't need gas. There are no minor fees. And the confirmation times are in seconds. In the Bitcoin protocol, at the time I, I took this from CoinCap, it cost 20, over $28 on average to send a Bitcoin transaction. And there was 172,000 unconfirmed transactions around the world. We all know if you've sent Bitcoin in the past couple months, you know it's going to take hours to get those six confirmations. Let's talk about Ethereum. Ethereum, at the time that I was creating this this weekend, the average Ethereum cost to send a transaction was 54 cents. Doesn't sound too bad, does it? 54 cents. But think about this. Every single on-chain transaction in Ethereum, if you were to do an upvote or if you were to write a post, you would, have to pay, you, you would be paying this gas cost. Right? Every transaction that you submit to the blockchain, you have to pay this gas cost. How are you going to build a business if your clients have to pay 54 cents every time they want to use your blockchain? Right? The arguments, of course, oh, we'll do all this off-chain. Off sure, but I'm talking about right now. Right? You can't build a business on Ethereum when you have to pay 54 cents for every single transaction that you submit to the blockchain. There's no way. Who's going to pay that? I sure won't. And it was taking an average time of four and a half minutes. How are you going to build any type of business that <laughs> costs 54 cents and takes four and a half minutes to confirm? I mean, that's, that's insane. I'd rather use a centralized Facebook than that. Oh, look at those sweet, adorable kitties. So at a blazing 20 transactions per second, the Ethereum was recently crippled by a single kitty app. Now, CryptoKitties is not a porn site for nerds, if you're not familiar. It is a little game on the Ethereum platform where you can like mate these cats and produce new cats with these DNA sequences and find rare cats. Anybody that played Final Fantasy VII in the, in the group will know that this is what you did with Chocobo Racing. So, all right. Any nerds in the house? Raise your hand. Yeah, all right. Um, DPOS wouldn't even blink an eye at this. It could have a thousand sweet, adorable crypto kitty apps on it uh, running every second. Not a problem. Took this, I took this image today. I, I'm, I know that we haven't talked about EOS a lot, but I think it's important to set the stage on where we are so that we can understand where we're going. All right, so that's what I'm doing here. Uh, my buddy Eric Voorhees runs and owns shapeshift.io. He had to put this disclaimer up on his website today that the Ethereum and Bitcoin networks are currently experiencing significant congestion transactions may be delayed for hours with Bitcoin that's days not good okay now we're starting to get into it governance and community I guess before I get here it's a good time to stop and take any questions about transactional throughput speed fees anything like that cats I love cats Anybody? Dun, 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 dun. Yes, over here. Yep. So in the case of Steven and Bit Share, um, what's stopping uh, the stakeholders, the holders of the coins, to have too much power? I mean, if they have a large portion of coins and the miners don't really have that much power in terms of voting power. Yep. Yeah. 
Yeah. So the question was, what prevents people from ha who have a lot of a coin, like in BitShares, from co-opting the network because they have the majority of the coins? Yeah. Yep. Yep. And and I'll I actually get to that in a couple slides. Right. No, it's, it's all good. Um, anybody else? Dun, dun, dun. Yes. DAX, yeah, BitShares is a DAC. It is a DAX. Oh, oh, DAPS. Oh, you mentioned that they yep. were going to use it to do ICOs, but can you build uh, basically software on top of it? Yeah, for sure. Uh, one of the mo I talked about one of those uh, DAPs earlier, which was the, S I mean, the uh, collateralization to a loan DAP. So you submit your collateral to the DAP, it locks up your collateral and allow it issues you uh, a loan in a uh, US dollar loan, you have, uh, I love it, you have access, while you have that loan outstanding, you have no access, the blockchain locks in and a smart contract locks in your collateral. Yeah, so I actually just interviewed a guy, um, George Harrop. He's the CEO of Bitspark.io. He, he runs a global remittance business. He actually moved away from Bitcoin and did his ICO on, uh, on BitShares because he's moving his entire company off of Bitcoin onto BitShares. And the reason is because the low fees, the instant or almost instant confirmation times. But since he does global remittance, he needs access to a lot of different currencies. So it's much more difficult as somebody who built an offshore bank, I can tell you, it's a lot more difficult to find um, currencies like Argentinian peso. How are you going to get a bank account for an Argentinian peso? Right, unless you're Argentinian and you're living in Argentina, you're not going to. There's no chance. On BitShares, you can basically create a Bit Smart asset, and this is going to get th this would get super technical. So I, I won't explain exactly how it works, but you could create a smart coin that gives you price exposure to the Argentinian peso without ever having to open up uh, a peso bank account or having to deal with any of their AML or KYC. Because what's important in the remittance business is that you have price exposure to these currencies, not that you actually hold the currencies. Because a lot of the time, the people on the other end who want the currency don't want the currency that you're sending them. For an example, if I was living in the United States and I had family in Mexico and I send them dollars through Western Union, well, they don't want dollars in Mexico, you know, they want pesos. So with BitShares, you're able to create, he's, he says he plans to create 120 fiat pegged bit asset currencies. So we'll see. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And, and any, anyone can come onto the BitShares platform if you have enough collateral and start creating and issuing um, these types of smart coins, just like US dollar Tether, right? I'm sure everybody's familiar with Tether. It's just a coin that's backed one to one with US dollars, we think, in a bank account somewhere. Well, we don't know if they actually have those US dollars in a bank account. They won't tell us. We just kind of trust them. In BitShares, you don't have to trust anyone because in order for the protocol to ever even create the US dollar tether or the US, they call them BitUSD, you have to submit 200% of that US dollar price into a smart contract and lock it up in the protocol. So if Tether was to do that, they would have to provably back every Tether coin that they issue with $2 worth of collateral in the bank, prove it to us, and lock it up, which, you know, of course they don't do that. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about community and governance real quick, because I think that, I think that this is one of the main areas that is causing the infighting currently in the Bitcoin space. And in, I've been in this space for long enough to remember when everybody liked everybody except everyone hated Ripple, <laughs> right? Those are the only bad guys in town. But now there's so much infighting within the Bitcoin community that it kind of drives me crazy. And, and it made me think, I'm like, why, why is there so much fighting? Why is there so much fighting? 
Back in the day, we were saving the world and we were banking the unbanked or unbanking the banked or whatever the hell you want to call it. We were sending each other a dollar at meetups and it was costing us a penny and it was happening instantly. And, you know, it was so exciting to help somebody set up their new wallet and we could just shoot them over some Bitcoin and the magic was there. And the, the look in their eyes, I sent somebody Bitcoin cash yesterday and like the look in his eyes was the same look that I used to get with Bitcoin years ago. And so, in my opinion, the reason that we have all of this fighting and all these forks is because there's no real voting mechanism in Bitcoin, right? The shareholders don't have a voice. The holders or the hodlers of the coins, they don't have a voice because the company is structured incorrectly. The company of Bitcoin gives the miners all of the voting power. We're dependent on the miners in Bitcoin and the stakeholders, the shareholders, the coin holders, we're almost nobodies. We're almost nobodies. And so without that voice, proof of work systems have no clear way to dispute disagreements or voice opinions. So we're online trolling each other on Twitter and begging our miners to run a certain type of software. And then we have all these forks, Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin Gold, Bitcoin Diamond, soon to be Bitcoin Super or super Bitcoin, Bitcoin Platinum, Bitcoin Cash Plus, Bitcoin Silver, Bitcoin Uranium, Bitcoin God, that's my favorite. And of course we have Ethereum Classic which suffers from the same issue because it's a proof of work system as well. It should be noted that Steam and BitShares has never had a Steam Classic or a BitShares Cash Fork and the original communities remain intact. If a blockchain is going to be the basis of how we build these communities in the future and how we set trust on a blockchain so that we don't have to trust each other, we can trust the blockchain to store our data and to store our historical records. How can you do that when there's no ability to voice your opinion and the only option you have if you disagree is to split off from the community? Without a clearly defined and effective governance mechanism, the only option to handle disputes is to fork the chain. But that also means fork the community. Not only does, it bring, does, not only does infighting bring like bad energy within your community, but it forks off your commu community, which makes it smaller, which reduces your hash power of your chain, which makes you more susceptible to attack. So what's the solution? I'm not, here to, I'm not here just to stand up and bitch, all right? The solution, in my opinion, is there needs to be smarter voting mechanisms. We can't possibly try to create systems where 100% of it is automated without any community. You're not going to be able to build a system that completely removes the human aspect and the human element from your society, all right? So offering coin holders or stakeholders a way to voice their opinions and to be heard based off their commitment to the community via consensus model, I think, is the answer. So, and I'll answer your question right here in a second. The key elements of this is you can vote on anything in BitShares, and in Steam, and soon to be EOS. You can vote on the transaction fees, right now there's zero, block intervals, the number of block producing nodes. You can decide who the node witnesses will be. Let's talk about witnesses. Oh, and you get to vote proportionally weighted to the amount of coins that you stake. Basically, if you come in with a million dollars and you stake a million dollars worth of coins, should you have one person, one vote? Or do you have more at stake? I think there's a really bad pun there somewhere, but literally you have more capital at stake. So the effects of the changes on the blockchain that you have your capital tied up in are more significant for you than somebody that comes in with 10 or a hundred dollars. Can't wait for those airplanes to be on the podcast, by the way. So, um, in, in delegated proof of stake, block producing nodes are called witnesses. They're also called block producers. You can use those interchangeably. 
Um, basically, when you make a transaction, you're broadcasting your transaction to the network, to the blockchain, just like you do in every other blockchain, Ethereum, Bitcoin, Litecoin, whatever. The witnesses in BitShares, there's 101 witnesses. So think of them as they sit, they sit around the world, they're decentralized, and it's in a round robin nature, right? So whenever people are submitting their transactions, every three seconds, one of those 101 witnesses is randomly selected, and it's up to them and their computer and their network to validate and say, okay, all of these transactions abide by the rules of our blockchain and I'm going to insert them into the next block and ship them away, right? Add it to the blockchain. In the next three seconds, since blocks come every three seconds in BitShares, someone else is randomly selected, a new witness or a new block producer. It's like, it's like a notary. It's like a transaction notary, basically. Yep, all of, I don't see any uh, discrepancies in, in these transactions. Put them in the blockchain, ship them on out, there you go. Right, Roman, you had a question. So are these nodes selected, witnesses selected randomly, or it's based on the stake, model stake you put in? And how do they get to 101? Why is 101 and not more or less? Yeah. How does one become part of this 101? Right. So the question was, how are the witnesses elected? Remember, we're talking about governance and community here. How are the witnesses elected? And what was the second part of the question? How are the witnesses elected? Is it really random, or it's based and on the stake they have proportionally? Right, right, right. Okay. So this is the difference of proof of stake and delegated proof of stake. So in proof of stake, and this is, this is to answer your question. In proof of stake, you have a percentage uh, chance to be the block witness based on your proportionate stake in the system. So if you had 51% stake in just a standard proof of stake system, you, every block you would have 51% chance to be that block producer or that witness. In delegated proof of stake, the witnesses, so this is an arbitrary number, this can be voted on, this could be 10, it could be 100, it could be 1,000, it could be 100,000, is, is as decentralized as the community wants it, they can vote on it. You vote for these people, right? You literally vote, you cast a vote on the blockchain. You, It's, it's, it's the most votes, right? It's not the most coin stake. These, don't, these 101 people, unlike proof of stake, which this would be the 101 people that had the most coin staked in the system, that's not how it works with delegated proof of stake. These are the people that, that the community thinks is the most reputable, right? Community is really important in delegated proof of stake because you, what's going on here? There we go. Because it's not just who has the biggest bag of money, it's who has, who has shown the most value in the community. It's not uncommon for uh, witnesses to run businesses on top of these blockchains. Or like my, the guy that I, in, that I interviewed, George Harrop of BitSpark.io, he runs a company that adds value to the BitShares network. You know, that would give him an advantage if he wanted to apply and, and start getting voted up to be a witness. Witnesses are paid out by the uh, block reward, kind of like how miners are paid out in Bitcoin. Witnesses in, uh, in BitShares and Steam and soon to be EOS are paid out uh, through, out of the block reward to, to like pay their salary to help them fund their data centers and their cost of electricity and bandwidth and, and all that stuff. Um, yeah, so it's most likely they will have a pretty large stake because they've been in the community for a long time and they've shown that they're a reputable person. But at any time, they can get voted out. And there's voting every single day, right? And so if, let's say this, this 101st person started acting a little bit screwy or it, it, it looked like that he was trying to manipulate the transactions because the transactions are broadcast to all 101 people. It's just one witness randomly in this round robin is the one to put it in the block and send it away. But if the other 101 are like, wait, you inserted a transaction there that sent a million bit shares to yourself and we didn't see that, us, the rest of us 101 people, like what type of squirrely stuff are you doing? They would flag it, bring it, bring it to a vote and vote this guy out. Yep, go ahead. Can you vote for yourself? 
Uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure if you can vote for yourself or not. Yeah, I don't know. No, no, because the number of witnesses are uh, set in the blockchain protocol. Yeah, so you would have to have a vote that says, there's, let's say there's 100,000 users of BitShare, it would have to be approved that, okay, we're going to change the number of witnesses to 100,000, right? But then anyone else that comes into the system, it wouldn't work. Did that answer your question? Go ahead. Okay, okay, cool. So, okay, we already went over a lot of this. Block production is performed in a round-robin pattern so that every node gets to produce one block per round. Um, each witness is paid for the blocks when they produce them, and a failure to do so can result into no payment, as well as the possibility of being voted out as a malicious node and their funds frozen, their witness funds frozen. Every day the network updates the witness list. Even if there's 101 people that are active witnesses, uh, witnessing and producing the blocks, there are hundreds more below them vying for this top witness category because they want that salary. So if one person gets voted out, there's a lot of people under them ready to step up to play. Uh, yeah, I guess I'll need to share this or something because I have a lot of links in here. But Okay, let's talk about centralization. That's another problem that we're currently encountering in both the, the two big blockchains, Ethereum and Bitcoin. One of the real advantages of blockchains is its ability to centralize. You know, we built this to try to counter the current legacy financial system because it's centralized all the way up to the top with the Federal Reserve. And to, to give you guys an idea, we were a little bitty Euro Pacific bank down here at the very bottom of the food chain in the Caribbean. If we, wanted to, if we wanted to transact in U.S. dollars, we had to get the, we, ha we had to open up account with a, a corresponding bank who then had to open account with a member bank who then had to have an account with the Federal Reserve. So basically every dollar is accounted for all the way up the chain to the Federal Reserve and then it would like go out to whoever we're trying to send to. Um, decentralization is, is the true power of blockchains. but. It hasn't been possible. Bitcoin's not decentralized. As much as the Bitcoin maximalists will want you to think, it's not decentralized at all. Nearly 68% of the hashing power is controlled by five miners. And uh, a couple of those are in China. This is what centralization looks like. This is the current centralization of the Bitcoin mining. Four miners control 51% or more of the network. What happens if four people want to collude <laughs> and fork Bitcoin? How is that centralization? Right? Look how small it gets so quickly. So what's the solution? One, like as we've said in the DPOS system, shareholders Members of the community of stake coins can not only vote on which community members validate blocks, but how many witnesses exist and are included in the round robin validation process. Additional decentralization is just a block is just a vote away, right? If you wanted to decentralize from 101 to 201, vote it, and the next hundred the 100 witnesses are now able to validate blocks. Also, if a witness doesn't produce a block in their block time time slot, three seconds then that time slot is skipped and the next witness will produce six seconds worth of time, right? Two blocks. That would mean a block time of six seconds rather than three. And this behavior would be quickly noticed and most likely resulting in being voted out or at least being questioned. This is a real person, right? This isn't just a random string of, of numbers representing an, an account. This has a community aspect to it. So here's a couple of the larger blockchains. Um, we just saw this one. This one's Bitcoin. <laughs> this is Ethereum. Yeah, okay. Uh, centralization max. This is Waves. This is BitShares. And this is Steam. Right? Which one looks less prone to attack and more decentralized? I think it's pretty obvious, right? Delegated proof of stake systems right here. These, these represent all the, you know, these represent the witnesses. Now, th they couldn't squeeze. I mean, I guess they could squeeze 101 in there, but I think you get the point. Um, EOS, 
probably the most mysterious ICO and project in existence right now. A year-long ICO. No, they, have, they don't talk about the project. They only give subtle hints, and they use legal speak at every presentation. So it's a third generation delegated proof of stake blockchain. BitShares was the first, Steam was the second, EOS is the third. Think about it as a blockchain operating system. So anyone here familiar with Linux? All right, we've got some nerds in the crew, all right. Um, so basically, back in my old programming days, I would appreciate Linux more than Windows because it came with a suite of tools and applications that made it easier for me to develop on, right? I didn't have to go install all these compilers or these IDEs or, you know, I got all of this by installing Linux and I could get up and get running more quickly, developing my software rather than setting up my environment, all right? This is exactly what EOS is trying to do for blockchain projects. It's trying to create a standard operating environment so that people can jump in and build blockchain companies or apps as quickly as possible. Basically, they want to bring out the tools and build the tools so that it's much easier and quicker to build things like Steam and BitShares. All right, so you don't have to build them from scratch every time. So, so there, um, also, it needs to support thousands of commercial use dApps. Right, decentralized apps. Unlike sweet, cuddly crypto kitties, as much as I love the project, one, one little app crushed Ethereum. Right? How are you ever going to build enterprise level or enterprise grade applications on a global scale when cats clog the world's supercomputer? You're not. To make it so fast is all the apps or all the dApps are executed in parallel with asynchronous communication. So you're never waiting on another app to finish for your app to get in queue. They can run in parallel. And you can run nodes that, that support the, only the applications that you need, right? Only the businesses. Remember, think of all this as businesses, right? As an entrepreneur, somebody that's interviewed 75 entrepreneurs, I don't want to have to run your business requirements. I don't want to have to support the resources that your business needs to run in order just to support my own business, right? With EOS, you only run the applications on the blockchain that you need to run, although the witnesses are required to run every application, all right? And that's why they get paid, because that takes a lot of resources. Language support, so there's a guy named Jason King. I've interviewed him a couple times. Really, really, really cool guy, old school Bitcoiner. He is building, he has literally bought a university and he is changing their computer science department to focus on Solidity because there is such a glut of Solidity developers out there, Solidity being the main smart contract application of Ethereum. There's so few Ethereum developers or Solidity developers that it's greatly holding back the development of the Ethereum blockchain and of the dApps and applications that can be built on top of Ethereum. Any Solidity developer is making $200,000 these days and they're in such high demand, it's not uncommon for them to jump around from project to project because you know, there's, there's so few of them and demand so high, why not go $400,000, $500,000, $600,000 a year on these projects? Because there's just not a lot of them. The native language of EOS is WebAssembly, which is fairly new. But what's really interesting is that large mature languages like C and C++, these object-oriented languages, can be compiled down into WebAssembly. So you could write, if you're a C or C++ programmer, are, are there any here, C or C++ programmers? All right, are there any Solidity programmers here? Point, pro oh, we got one, all right. And you probably make a billion dollars a year, congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> 
So what's nice is that C and C++ has been in development for, for decades, right? And so there's a lot of people out there that know how to program in C and C++ that can jump right on and start developing native applications on the EOS blockchain because C and C++ have compilers that compile down into WebAssembly, right? And what's really interesting is that they're working on a compiler for Solidity into WebAssembly. So what does that mean? Anybody? Anybody? That means anybody that has written Solidity code for the EOS blockchain, I mean for the Ethereum blockchain, can compile their code down into WebAssembly, which runs on EOS, right? You can't, you can't release your app on Ethereum because one cat app is using 100% of the transactional throughput, right? So why not compile your Solidity app down into WebAssembly and run it natively within a browser? Right? Firefox supports WebAssembly to run natively, very fast. Okay, Let's, everybody wants to know about the EOS token, right? Yes, in the back. You can write C and C++ and compile it into WebAssembly, compile it down into WebAssembly, and then run that WebAssembly on the EOS network, on the EOS blockchain. Yeah. C and C++ won't natively run on EOS, but compilers are available where you can compile it to a form where it will run. So now there's you know, millions of people around the world who know how to program C and C++. Think about this, the development speed advantage that that's going to give to the EOS blockchain as opposed to the Ethereum blockchain. No longer do we have to buy out computer science departments to try to bootstrap new computer scientists into learning Solidity. We'll just get from this pool that we already have of C and C++ programmers. Okay, so let's talk about, I guess I'll take any more questions there before we start talking about the token. The token's super interesting and we're getting towards the end here and this is my favorite part, so. All right. Token time. So everyone, I assume, is familiar with Ethereum. In Ethereum, you have to have Ethereum in your wallet. And if you want to send an ERC-20 token, then it takes gas. Gas is basically just a small amount of Ethereum to permission yourself to send and use the Ethereum blockchain. Super annoying. The other day, I was trying to sell my very last ERC-20 tokens as I cleaned out every token I had to buy EOS, and I had some Augur tokens, and I didn't have any Ethereum, and I couldn't send my Augur. I couldn't even use Shapeshift to exchange some of my Augur to Ethereum because I couldn't send Augur. So I'm like scurrying around all of my wallets, and I finally find a wallet with like 0.1 Ethereum in it, and I have to send it over to this wallet and then with the Augur in it, and then I could send the Augur away, but now I've got this Ethereum, and I just sent it away to the, to the, to the exchange, and finally just got rid of all that garbage and got my EOS tokens, and I'm good to go. Right. This is a pain. Not only is it ex expensive because you have to keep a coin that you don't necessarily want, but you're kind of forced to use to get access to the blockchain, but it, it, it requires an inconvenience for your customers to have these coins as well. They can't just use your coin on the blockchain. They have to have your coin and the access token. EOS takes care of all of that. F coming back to our company analogy, think about EOS as shares in the platform. All right, shares in the platform. Now, what is the platform? All right, the platform is an environment which offers you tools and resources to quickly and easily build your smart applications on top of it. Let's use the Linux example again. Whenever you install Linux, if you are building an application on top of Linux, you have access to the Linux storage space file system, right? You have access to its RAM. You have access to its, uh, its Ethernet card, right, if you need to communicate. You have access to its processing power. These are all things that decentralized applications require to run, right? If you're building a graphics rendering application on top of EOS, well, you need the resources of the platform, of the operating system, to render your 3D models. 
All right, you need storage space. Well, what if you build a social media website within EOS where you're going to need you're going to need those, that transaction throughput? All right, you're going to need to communicate, have all, a way for your, all of your users to communicate. What EOS does is if you own 1%, this is theoretical, if you own 1% of all the EOS tokens, then you have control or access to 1% of all the network resources. Bandwidth, RAM, CPU cycles, file storage, whatever. Right? If you want access to file storage, for instance, then you stake your coins with that file storage company. Right? Let's say I've created a file storage company and I'm, I'm offering file storage on the EOS network. You would stake your coins with me and then I would allocate that amount of file storage to you. Since there's constant inflation or constant new coins being created in the EOS environment, the people that have coins staked to them get paid out the new coin production. So if you have allocated or you have delegated or you have staked your coins to me in order to use my file storage, the new inflation that comes out that's proportionately associated with your coins, I now get that inflation, so I get that payment. Instead of the, instead of the inflation only going to the miners, the inflation now comes to the entrepreneur because your coins are staked with me for my service. I get paid out of the inflation. Whenever you no longer need my service, your coins get unlocked, your files get deleted and freeze up my server space, and your coins get distributed back to you. Yes? Mm. Inflation is set at the protocol level. In the EOS constitution, it says that it will never be more than 5%. Once the, once the ICO is done, the max inflation ever can be 5% per year. You can bring this up to a vote. So this is another one of the things you can vote on, where the inflation could be zero, or the inflation could be 1% or 2% or 3%. But the important thing is that the coins are never burned. The coins are never spent. The coins are never taken out of existence. Unless, of course, somebody loses their key or something. But then one aspect of the EOS environment is account recovery. So they've, they, I think they've solved account recovery uh, with a social type of contract. But the important thing is, whatever the inflation rate is, let's just say it's X, inflation rate X. If you need file storage, then you stake your EOS coins with me. Now, rather than staking them with yourself, where you would be proportionately given the new inflation, so you weren't affected by the new coin uh, dilution, right? It's like stock dilution, right? It's like what if a company kept what if a company kept diluting their stock, but they were paying out. If if you were like, hey, I'm going to commit my stock to you guys, they diluted the stock, but they give you a proportion of. The, the new stock to you so you don't recognize, you don't realize any of that stock dilution or that coin inflation. If you delegate your coins over to a service provider, you no longer get that coin inflation, right? So you are theoretically losing purchasing power of your coin because there's new coins being introduced in the system and rather than coming to you, it's going out to the people that you delegated to and that you're using their services. Once you no longer need those CPU cycles or that RAM usage or the server space, you unlock your coins out of a smart contract, your coins come back to you, and then you have the same amount of coins, you can use them again, lock them up for bandwidth or whatever. Whatever. Yeah. Yes. So um, if you build a file storage company on EOS, uh, let's say I have 1% of the coins, right? Um, then I am um, entitled to 1% of file storage usage on your company. Now, in that case, um, the penalty would be that for every single person that is on EOS platform to just you know, use that as they will, is that they're going to lose that inflation power. If they give it to them, lose inflation. But in the future, when all the coins are mined, um, there'll be less penalty for me to just do that in my whim, right? If it's the mining limit. 
No, so there's constant inflation. Constant yeah, yeah, constant voluntary inflation. It, you can vote, you can bring the inflation percentage every year up to a vote, and if it gets voted on, it could be zero inflation, which, I mean, that would never happen because that, that ruins the payment mechanism. But maybe, maybe the price is starting to get too low, and they want to reduce the amount of inflation to try to strengthen the price of the EOS token a bit, and so maybe they lower the inflation down to 3% or 2%. Exactly. That, that's exactly where they come from. That's the only payment, right? Because you're locking your coins up with the service provider. They're getting your inflation payout. And then whenever you unlock, you get the exact same number of coins back. So in this case, in order for someone to use your um, company, to use your app, I have to have yield token. You, you got it. Yep, exactly. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll answer. This is, this is the most fundamental aspect of EOS. So if you've got questions, now is definitely the time to ask them. Because we're going to get into like investment and cash flow opportunities with staking and delegating coins after this. Yes. What, what, uh, for example, if I have a lot of computation uh, resources, what's the incentive for me to give out to the the network like under under the consensus the consensus for that? I stay close. Right, so I think the question is, if you have a lot of computational resources, say you have a data center somewhere, like what's your incentive to offer those resources to the network? Right. Yeah, um, I mean, monetary incentive. I mean, how much is your data center worth when it's just sitting there without the power on, right? Or maybe you could use that data center to mine Bitcoin, or maybe you find it best more uh, you can make more money by offering it to the EOS network, or maybe you could mine Ethereum. You know, I, I'm not sure. That that's where you, as the entrepreneur, would have to figure out the best use of it. I mean, uh, even if I offer it to my computation resources, I don't get a block reward. Like, how how can I get that? Like yeah, you do get block reward. But the block re reward is like going to the the people that well, that stake on me, right? No, no, no. So if I staked with myself, then I would get a proportionate amount of the block reward. So basically the inflation doesn't dilute my EOS tokens or my shares. If I delegate my EOS tokens to you to use your computational resource, your, comp your data center, for instance, I no longer get that inflation payout. You get my inflation payout from my coins because I've staked and delegated them to you. All right, let's, let's rock and roll. Ah, this is my favorite part. Okay, blockchain real estate. <laughs> this is the retirement plan right here, people. This is the retirement plan. So what if you could lend out your coins without risk of theft or default and get paid a daily dividend, right? What if you could set your own APR and duration of the lease. You're effectively lending out your right to use the platform, right? I'm, I'm gonna give an exhibit hall example here. <laughs> Actually, I may have added this to, to the next slide, but I don't know how to go back, so. Uh, let's just do it visually. Think of uh, exhibit hall, all right? This is, this is an exhibit hall. But let's also think of it as like the resources of the EOS blockchain, okay? If this is confusing, interrupt me at any time, all right? Because this is one of the main reasons. I mean, all the other stuff I said about EOS, it, the technical aspects amaze me. I think it's by far the best blockchain for sure. But this is, as a businessman, this is the most exciting part about it. All, this is property. This is, this, is a, this is a floor, right? This is the resources of EOS. Every bit, like in a true free market system, every bit of this is owned privately, right? Right, it's all owned. I'm just gonna shortcut it here a little bit. Right, everything's owned. Every, every access to every resource is currently owned. Right? These are the EOS resources. So knowing what we know now, that you can delegate your access
to the EOS, EOS resources, if you don't need them, you can lend them out, right? Well, there's a finite amount of access tokens, the EOS tokens. So if you're not using your access tokens, your EOS tokens, and somebody else needs the resources of the EOS blockchain, let's say you're a dApp developer and you need uh, bandwidth, you need some file storage, and you need some CPU processing, right, to build your application. Well, you have two options. You can either buy the EOS tokens on the market, and maybe they cost $20 a token, and you need 1,000 of them, uh, 5,000 of them, to gain enough resources to support the business that you're trying to build, or you can rent them from me, right? Or from anyone else that owns these tokens. I can delegate or temporarily suspend my access to the, my control of these tokens and give that to you so that you can in turn delegate it to someone else and then use those resources, all right? So here's me up here in this block. I say up instead of this block, I'm going to lend my resources to Trish, right? Now, what happens then? Trish has the ability to use those resources to allocate to herself and to her business to, <laughs> to, to use the resources to build her business on, right? And this isn't theoretical. Let's go to the next slide here. Oh, okay, well, let, let's go to this example. So as an example, if you had 5,000 tokens, they're currently about $4, all right? So we're talking about like $20,000, which is maybe a lot, maybe not a lot for you. 5,000 tokens, let's say they go to $20, and I have chose $20 because that would put EOS at 50% of Ethereum's current market cap, okay? <laughs> Just ballparking things here. $20 token, 5,000 tokens, a 10% APR. You're looking at $833 a month in actual passive cash flow. There's no employees, there's, there's no bills to pay. You can reclaim your tokens at any time, right? The person lending the tokens can, maybe with a penalty, recall your tokens because you're not giving up, you're not giving up ownership of your tokens, you're only giving up temporary access to your tokens, right? You're, you're offering temporary control of your tokens not ownership of your tokens, which is really important because somebody can't run away with your tokens, right? There's no repo man necessary because you're delegating away the access to the resources, not the, not the ownership of the tokens. This is happening right now. People are doing this, right? This is not theoretical. So this is called Minnow Booster. This is an app or a dApp built on top of the Steam blockchain. As you know, Steam was the second delegated proof of stake system. I'm gonna drink beer while that airplane goes overhead. And I've done this countless times, by the way. This is a basically an order book or a market for delegated Steam tokens. Live right now, minnowbooster.net, minnowbooster.net. Highly recommend you go there and check it out. So what is this? Let's say that you have 5,000 Steam tokens. That What does that give you, 5,000 Steam tokens? Well, in the Steam blockchain, what Steam tokens give you is the more tokens you have staked, the more powerful your vote is. So if I had 5,000 Steam token stake, maybe my upvote is worth 50 cents. And if you had five Steam token stake, maybe your upvote is worth one cent, right? Because it's just the ability to control or to, to influence the blockchain. In Steam, the only way you can influence the blockchain is by telling the blockchain where to allocate the new block, block payouts right, the new inflation payouts. That's really the only way in the Steam blockchain you can use delegated staking. So what, what does this even mean here? Somebody is looking for 14,653 Steam, all right? So basically what you would do is you would delegate your Steam, 14,653 Steam, you would delegate that to them. You would temporarily lose control of that steam, but not ownership. 
so that now when you upvote somebody, it's worth a lot less because you've delegated away that influence, all right? But what do you get in return? Well, they say they want it for four weeks. They're willing to pay 150 steam over those four weeks. Minnow Booster takes a 10% cut for being the market maker. So you get 135 steam paid out in a daily liquid dividend over a four week period for lending out that 14,653 steam for an APR after their 10% cut of 9.2% uh, APR, right? 9.2% interest per year. Well, since this is a free floating market, some people are willing to pay a lot more. Look, this person down here is willing to pay 23% APR, 23%, all right? Granted, it's only for four weeks, but you lend out almost 5,500 steam, you're getting paid after the commission, 126 steam over a four week period. And what's really interesting about this is that it's paid to you in a daily dividend where you can repower it up and relend it out immediately. <laughs> right? Seriously. 23%. So this is happening on the baby blockchain, which is Steam. This was, this was a stepping stone to what EOS is going to be. The only resource that you have access to in Steam is the ability to post or the bandwidth of the Steam network itself. But if you have just a couple Steam, you're never going to run out of bandwidth. And the ability to influence the blockchain to pay out the block rewards to what, whatever authors you like, right? Your, your, your upvote is more powerful. But this is happening. This is happening right now. Yep. The inflation comes from people, um, the, the witnesses basically, right? They, they, they validate the transactions and then they get paid. Um, that's the only part, or, and they do get paid uh, interest as well, but that's essentially the mining behind the whole system, right? Uh, uh, okay, say it one more time, ask it one more time. Um, so in, in delicate proof of stake blockchains, um, the witnesses get paid for their, for their validation. For the, validating. They're one type of entity that is incentivized and gets paid, right? Right. I guess you have multiple entities that are going to get paid through the system. Yep. But that's where the mining occurs. Because, I mean, there's no physical proof of work. It's just proof of stake. I just want to clarify the mining aspect for myself. Yes. Yeah, so there, there are no, like, miners right. that are, like, using hash power right. to, to try to unlock a block, right? right? They're, the inflation is set right. by a vote on the blockchain, in the protocol, and the inflation just basically comes and dumps, 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 and it's allocated based off of who has the token staked. Right, right, so the token just gets created basically. Yeah. All the witnesses do is basically they witness all the transactions that come into each block, they it. and they validate it, and they add it to the blockchain. Okay. Yeah, yeah, cool, yep. All right, I'm not going to go into these common criticisms. If you can make the argument, <laughs> then I'll be glad to answer it, but I'm just not going to stand up here and continue on all of these common criticisms and questions. I'll probably post this because those are links that, um, that go into detail about like, why these common criticisms aren't actually uh, inherently bad or risky or an attack vector for delegated proof of stake. Um, but again, the only thing I will say is that max block size um, is variable and it depends on the throughput of the system. As far as I can tell, it's really technical and there's not a lot of information about it. So that link actually goes to the open source software th where the block size is, uh, is created or is uh, the parameters of the block size is determined. A uh, little bit over my head there as well. But okay, I think that might be it. Okay, so I've got a ton of resources, interviews, blog posts, everything. If you want to scan that with your phone, I've put a Google Doc together where it has maybe, uh, maybe 20 different articles and interviews and podcasts. It also links to the common criticisms because I'm not going to stand up here and just tell you that everything's great and that nobody has any valid criticisms. I have links to all those criticisms in that document as well if you want to go through there and check it out.
Yes, Trish. Um, the question was, is anyone else using delegated proof of stake blockchains? And yes, there are a couple. Um, I can't recall them off the top of my hand. I think it is Lisk and Arc. Uh, I'm pretty sure Arc, they're both smart app platforms, blockchains, and I'm pretty sure Arc is a, and I can be wrong, So, but I think Arc was a clone or a fork of Lisk to begin with. But Dan Larimer is the guy that invented delegated proof of stake. He invented the concept of a decentralized autonomous corporation. He worked with Satoshi back in the day and didn't think that proof of work was a very efficient way to secure a blockchain. And so that's what got him thinking proof of stake. Okay, well, there's inherent issues with proof of stake. What about as, an, as a, a, a libertarian and as an anarchist, he looked into the real world and saw what has worked for us in real life as to like bring societies together. And how can I combine the best of the physical world with the best of the digital blockchain world? And that's how he came up with delegated proof of stake. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Yes. Small question. Hmm? Um, the, I read about EOS and I saw some people say that in the white paper, um, it doesn't give, so you can buy the RC20 tokens now, but they don't uh, uh, allow you to change them for EOS uh, coins. Right. They don't say that in the white paper. Yeah. So. What a lot, what's kept a lot of people out of buying the EOS tokens at this point, since it is a year-long crowd sale, which is unheard of, right? Everybody has these crowd sales that everybody runs into, and one day it goes crazy, it clogs the entire uh, Ethereum network, and then as soon as they're released on exchanges, they drop 50% and everybody's bag holding, right? So to prevent whales coming in and buying up all the EOS tokens, they have this really clever one year type of ICO that there's only 2 million tokens that are distributed every single day. It doesn't matter how much you, how many people submit money to the crowd sell in that day. There's only 2 million tokens. So if I was the only person that day to submit one Ethereum, to the crowd sale, I would essentially get all 2 million EOS tokens for one Ethereum, right? But that doesn't happen because I don't live in a vacuum. What happens is there's a lot of people tr vying for these EOS tokens in the crowd sale, but they don't want to bid too much because if they bid too much, all of a sudden they don't get as many EOS tokens for their Ethereum investment. Now, what you heard was that the, the ERC-20 token has no rights, no value, no nothing. It, it has no promises. You know, they legalize the, everything out of the ERC-20 token. And that's because they wanted to do their crowd sell before the EOS blockchain was ever launched. All right, they wanted to build their community and they wanted to distribute their tokens before the EOS blockchain was ever launched. And the one thing that Ethereum does really well right now is ICOs, right? It uh, gives people the ability to create their own token. So the EOS team is using Ethereum for one of the only things that it's currently really good at, which is uh, token distribution. But once the, IC once the EOS ICO is closed, there's going to be a 48, uh, maybe a 72 hour window where you link up your Ethereum, your ERC20 wallet address that has your EOS tokens, your, your, EO, your ERC-20 tokens with a EOS um, address and you will be included in the Genesis block of the EOS blockchain. So let's say you had 5,000 tokens, the ERC-20 tokens, you have up to June the first is the end of the crowd sale, so you have 48 hours after that, so June the third to sync your Ethereum address where your EOS tokens are stored to an address where you've created a new EOS address and then you will be included in the Genesis block of the EOS blockchain and be allocated the, EO, the, the native EOS blockchain tokens in that address. Yeah, that's keeping a lot of people out. And so I think that confusion has really dampened and suppressed the price. Um, I, 
I can't believe it's it's only at four dollars, but it's headed a lot higher. Yes. So if you're buying the, the EOS tokens on exchanges, yeah. So if you buy the EOS token on exchanges as for now, um, or if you buy the ICO, so do you get the native tokens if you buy the ICO and you get the ERC20 token? There is no native token. So the question was, do you get the native token if you buy in the ICO, or do you, and do you get the ERC20 token if you buy on the exchange? Well, there is no native token right now because there's no functioning operational EOS doc, uh, blockchain, right? You can't have a native token until you have your blockchain built. The reason that all of these ERC20 tokens could issue, uh, to I mean, all these ERC20 companies could issue tokens is because they were able to use right on top of a, a functioning Ethereum blockchain. They didn't have to build their own blockchain or side blockchain or whatever on top of Ethereum. They could just issue their tokens on Ethereum. So no, everyone has ERC20 tokens until the EOS blockchain is, is live. So currently, the tokens that are they can buy on exchanges, um, are they? Because you're saying the token value kind of fluctuates depending on how many people put in money on each individual day. Yep. So if you buy a certain amount of tokens, how do you know what your actual token is going to be worth on the day of um, project release? But you don't. So I mean, I don't even put, put the dollar value, but I mean, like, because you're saying there's two million tokens every single day, right, being released. Right. But let's say you know that day there's ten million dollars. Uh, Equal the equivalent fiat value being poured in, um, and then the next day it's twenty million. Yep. Um, so you distribute that just just to two million tokens. So we'll, let's use easier numbers. There's two million tokens every day that get distributed until June the 1st of the EOS ICO. If a million dollars gets put in, then every dollar gets two EOS tokens back. If two million dollars gets put in, every dollar gets one. Right. If four million dollars, every every dollar gets a half of an EOS token. So it disincentivizes big whales coming in, pushing a ton of millions and millions of dollars to try to get all of these EOS tokens and commandeer the network. Because if you go and put ten million dollars in one day, it will, that doesn't mean you're going to get more tokens. You may just be spending more per token. And you can go to EOSScan.io and take a look at what the historical price has been for the EOS tokens during the crowd sell. Yep. Um, sorry. Yep, ask, yep. Continuing on with the question, I just want to clarify for myself again. Um, so if a whale comes in and pays like $10 million uh, within this year, they're only gonna get um, 10 million out of whatever total amount of money that's been put in through the house sale. Yeah, exactly. If he puts in 10 million and there was 15 million total put in, well, you know, he would get two thirds of those two million tokens. Where if he went to the exchange and put in ten million dollars, maybe he could get a lot more than that. Because you don't know your price of the EOS token until it's done for, right? Until the distribution period has ended. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, so the question was is what if you don't have time within that 48 hours after the EOS crowd sell ends? You're not, you, you're not restricted to only mapping uh, during that 48 hours. You can map right now. So you can, you can map through MetaMask or you can map through my, my Ethereum wallet. Uh, you can go ahead and map and get it set up. And there's already tools available that can confirm your Ethereum address to your EOS address mapping. Um, I sh I'll, I'll try to, since that's a live document you guys scan to, I'll try to include links to that, that type of stuff. Uh, they're Steemit articles. Yeah, great question. If you don't map in time, theoretically, uh, since after the ICO is over, uh, the EOS team is going to make all of the EOS ERC-20 tokens um, static. You can't move them ever again. They are going to build in um, some tolerance of some sort so that you can map them after the fact. You just won't be in the Genesis block, but maybe you can be in a future block and get paid, you know, get rewarded your EOS tokens. Yeah, great question. You know, so I'm not too familiar with IOTA and I'm really not gonna get into it here. I know that IOTA is not a blockchain at all. Um, it uses something called Tangle, which yeah, when you wanna send one transaction, you have to confirm two transactions before you, but I, I'm, real, I'm really pretty ignorant about IOTA. I know that delegated proof of stake 
without any additional optimization can reach 100,000 transactions per second. And in stage four of the EOS blockchain release, which is going to be fall of 2018, they're going to concentrate on some optimizations, which they think they can get it much faster, up into maybe a million transactions per second. You know, it, it's this argument of should we scale on chain? Should all transactions be on chain? Should we scale off chain? You know, I think that if you can build software to allow all transactions on chain, um, then why not? Yeah. I know it went a hell on a run, a hell of a run lately, <laughs> price-wise. I've never owned any of it. I don't know anything about it. Anybody else? All right. Well, thank you guys. It's been a pleasure.